Do you remember when the Scarab name appeared on the Formula 1 entry list? As it was over 60 years ago, probably not, but the team's short-lived time in F1 is a story worth telling. In ancient Egypt, the Scarab Beetle's likeness was particularly emblematic, but after the Romans invaded, that symbolism disappeared between the sands of time. That was until the 1950s, where Scarabs briefly made an appearance in the lexicon of American motorsport. In its metallic baby blue scheme, the reign of the Scarab was short-lived, but successful in the field of sports cars, starting out in the amateur competitions and culminating in victory at the Riverside International Grand Prix, thanks to the efforts of mechanic-slash-racer Chuck Day. But the American mark was unable to make a fruitful transition to Formula 1, enjoying nothing more than sporadic appearances at the back of the grid in 1960, before disappearing at the end of the year. The man behind the Scarab project was Lance Reventlow, an American entrepreneur who had his eyes set on racing grandeur. Setting up a crack team of engineers and technicians well versed in the demands of the US racing scene, Reventlow hopes to beat the likes of Ferrari and Maserati at their own game, and deliver success for an all-American manufacturer. Reventlow not only bankrolled the Scarab project, he also drove. The Scarab F1 project, aiming to make the grid for the 1959 championship, arrived during a pivotal change to the world of motorsport. Thanks to the exploits of John Cooper, who had put the engine in the back of his F1 cars to resounding success, the rest of the field had begun to follow suit, even Ferrari whose owner claimed that the horse didn't push the cart. Clearly not quite with the times, Scarab rocked up with a front engine car, which immediately put the team on the back foot. That engine was penned by veteran engine designer Leo Goosen, who put together a 25 litre straight 4 engine with Mercedes-inspired Desmodromic valves. Goosen, then working for Offenhauser, then handed the drawings over to Jim Travers and Frank Coons to build and maintain. Mounted sideways to reduce the overall frontal area, the engine was united with a front-mounted 5-speed Corvette-derived transmission and an off-centre differential at the rear. For the car itself, Reventlow's band of American hot rod and sports car enthusiasts, led by Phil Remington, were to develop Scarab's first tilt, an F1 package. Reventlow wanted to continue the all-American theme throughout the Scarab's technical makeup but hit a snag when it came to the braking system. Intending to use an innovative drum brake system within the car, using ideas sourced from the aviation industry, Reventlow had to swallow his national pride when faced with cooling problems. He allowed his technicians to fit the car with battle-ready girling disc brakes, as the British company had a wealth of experience producing F1-grade braking systems. By then, the Scarab team's target of entering in 1959 had long since passed, and further delays meant the team elected not to venture to Buenos Aires for the 1960 season opener, instead waiting until Monaco. There, Reventlow's patriotism was dented further, as American rubber manufacturer Goodyear had supplied the team with a particularly hard construction of tyre. A late switch to Dunlop gave Scarab a tyre that was up to the task, but it soon emerged that the cars were overwhelmingly slow in comparison to the competition. The rear-engine cars had greater traction, reduced weight, and improved aerodynamics and handling, and the outdated Scarabs were left in the wake of its competitors. The Offenhauser-derived engine itself was also considerably less powerful compared to the others on the grid. Cooper and Lotus both had the Coventry Climax engines at their disposal, which both churned out around 50 horsepower more. The problem snowballed as the car was barely ready when it was shipped off to Europe for the Monaco Grand Prix. But, perhaps taken in by the metallic baby blue paint scheme, Sterling Moss, then driving for Rob Walker's privateer team, was rather intrigued by the Scarab. A couple of weeks before the Monaco Grand Prix, Revenlo let Moss take the wheel around Monte Carlo. Some of the car's design was familiar to Moss, then about to embark upon his first race for Lotus, as the Scarab also used a Colin Chapman-designed suspension package, which the team had paid for with a transporter in lieu of cash. Reflecting on it some years later, Moss enthused that for a front-engine car built in America, it was pretty damn good, but to come to Europe and expect it to beat the rear-engined ones, it just wasn't on. Moss, in his own Lotus, took pole with a 1 minute 36.3 seconds. By comparison, Day was on a 1 minute 47, and Reventlow on a 1 minute 48.5. Having both been well off Maurice Trantignon's cutoff of a 1.39.1, .1, neither car qualified. Scarab would have to wait for its first F1 race. Both cars qualified for the following Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort a week later, but neither Day nor Reventlow took to the grid over a dispute over the non-payment of starting money, and so the team's wait to race was further extended, finally making their long overdue debuts at Spa-Francorchamps. The cars were significantly more competitive than on their Monaco appearances after some fine fettling at base, but Reventlow and Day were still stuck at the back of the field. 
The troublesome desmodromic valve engines then pulled themselves apart, revent lows expiring after just a solitary lap when the piston broke through the engine block. The engines did the same again during the following French Grand Prix at Ram, albeit with Ferrari driver Richie Ginther taking over from revent low for the round. Although the desmodromic valves would in theory allow the engines to rev higher, they couldn't cope with the load on the long straights. Further failures meant that the team elected to withdraw before the race, although Ginther had set a time good enough to wedge himself in between the privateer Coopers at the rear of the grid. Scarab was tempted back for one last hurrah at the season closer at Riverside, on the team's home California turf. While Reventlow decided not to drive, Day spent a vast amount of time with his technicians in preparation, attempting to fix the engine issues that had plagued the car. He took the car to 10th place, while attempting to nurse the engine to the finish to avoid the problems that it had suffered in the previous rounds. But having poured a significant amount of money into the project for little reward, Revenlo decided not to follow F1's switch to 1.5-litre engines in 1960, allegedly starting to lose interest in his racing project. Segaro continued to race with its F1 car in other series in 1961, building a rear-engine variant for the following year with a 3.5-litre Buick V8 in the back. But with an FIA rule change, it was only permitted to start in Formula Libre events, and Scarab signed off at the end of 1962 with a sports car bearing the same engine, before Reventlow swore off racing for good. He died in a plane crash in 1972, after scouting in Colorado for real estate opportunities. An enigmatic character, Reventlow was almost reluctantly wealthy, or as Day put it following his death, a loner because of his background, a poor little rich boy. Day added that Reventlow was a good driver but he wasn't great. He had the skill, but he didn't have the confidence. The Scarab lives on in competitive historic racing today with Bronson behind the wheel, who contends that the car could have been competitive had it arrived when it was expected to, and had it opted for a conventional Offenhauser engine. But although the baby blue Beetles weren't competitive, they were stunning to look at.